bartender. And to me, bartending is about so much more than just serving drinks. It's about community. So you can only imagine how heartbroken I was when the pandemic hit and we were basically forced to just close our doors indefinitely. I tried to find other sources of income. I even tried running a cocktail delivery service for a while. I did okay, but just not nearly enough to live comfortably. I was looking at having to sell my car, pawn a guitar or two, but the final straw came when it looked like I might have to put my dog up for adoption. I can put up with a lot of nonsense, man, but the idea of having to take Ripper to the pound, never. I just couldn't. That's when I got desperate. Desperate enough to consider something pretty drastic. To make it clear, I'm a guy in my late 20s, not completely awful looking, but definitely not Brad Pitt. So I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to many of you when I say that my financial salvation came when I started a, yep, you sure could guess it, an OnlyFans account. It all started when I heard two of my friends talking about dad bods. Dad bods, I remember saying. You'd for real prefer a beer gut to a six pack? Okay, not like a beer gut, she said with a giggle. But like, I don't know, like, the slightly out of shape look, it just feels real and besides, gym rats just don't seem fun, you know? Dad bods are like, chill. That was probably some bad phrasing on my part, but you get the picture. The whole dad bod thing had been around for a while. But when I told the girl she must have something of a niche interest, she just laughed. Nope, it's way more popular than you think. And she brings up this OnlyFans profile of some Nick Offerman looking dude who had like a ton of posts up, all with a buttload of likes and comments. This guy makes thousands of dollars a month. His profile is free to sub too, but he does a bunch of request stuff too. Watch. I'm like, no, 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 no. Thinking she's about to show me this guy's junk or whatever, but no. Apparently the guy did like tuck you in videos or good morning sweetie videos where he pretends to wake up next to you before offering you breakfast and stuff. It was the tamest adult content imaginable, legitimately PG-13 stuff and he was charging upwards of $50 for a personalized video. The whole rest of my shift I kept thinking about that guy, thinking how happy he must be to get all this money and his following was so wholesome too. What's not to like about a setup like that? Sure, I bet there was some steamier stuff behind a paywall somewhere, but come on. A few thousand bucks a month just to tell some girl to sleep well? Why couldn't I get a piece of that sweet, sweet OnlyFans money? But nah, I'm not that guy, or at least I wasn't. I had all the confidence of two-day-old fawn back then, but then again, I suppose desperation drives us to do stuff out of the ordinary. It was pretty surreal setting up the account, like I had to come up with a fake name and an attractive username, I had to take a display picture selfie and banner picture. It was a whole thing. I was doubting myself the entire time, but I still went and did it, and since all the pictures were as anonymous as I could make them, those masks helped to protect more than just my breathing, I suppose, I wasn't all that concerned about getting found out. Besides, that would pretty much be the end of the whole thing. It wasn't like I was going to actually get any followers or anything, right? Right? Well, wrong. Because maybe three days after, just when I was starting to forget about the whole thing, I get an email notification from OnlyFans that says, like, user 7876 is now following you, just to be as generic as possible. I'd set up my sub fee to $4.99, then when I checked the payout section, boom. Like $4 was headed into my bank account at the end of the month as an upfront charge. I also had a direct message that just read, Loving your pictures. Can't wait to see more. X. I couldn't tell who the person was. There was no bio on their account. Nothing to even clue me into if they were male or female, but still. I just reply, Thank you so much. If you know anyone who might enjoy my content, please share my profile with them. I get a, Will do in return then that's that. A few days later, I get another sub, then another, and by the end of the week I have a grand total of 10. Loyal but totally anonymous subscribers. The extra $40 a month was paying for most of Ripper's dog food by that point. Not the good stuff, but 
I didn't have to consider giving him up anymore, and that meant you can bet your butt I carried on posting. If the only way was up, then up I was going. By the end of my six week of OnlyFans, I had just short of 50 followers and was making just under 200 bucks a month, and I put that down to solely me opening myself up to special requests. A lot of them came in the form of daddy stuff, which is undeniably kinky, but still mostly just sweet and affectionate. I didn't have a problem with it at all, and once I'd gotten a little confidence under my belt, I'd go so far as to say that I got pretty good at it. But as it turned out, the real money was in a kind of domination that was considerably less wholesome. Some people didn't want me to just be nice to them. They wanted me to be really, really mean. I remember the first time I started to feel really disillusioned with the whole thing. One special request wanted me to make a video where I basically just downright was abusive. Then when I read that they wanted me to call them all kinds of slurs, I just felt gross. It was the first time I'd had actual confirmation that some of my subscribers were gay guys, but that wasn't really it. It was the things they wanted me to call them. They're what made me feel deeply uncomfortable. I replied to the DM saying, sorry, I can't do that. Is there anything else I can work in for you? But no. The reply was almost instant and it consisted of them just doubling the dollar amount they were offering. The first time they did that, I actually got a little offended. Did they honestly think that I'd just cave because they flashed some cash? It was about principle, not making money. So you can guess how straight up gross I felt when they threw a four figure amount at me. And I, I feel gross just typing this, but yeah, I accept it. I called them some of the most despicable things that have ever come out of my mouth. And you know, I did a pretty good job of it too. I wanted that money. And it's honestly shameful how quickly I abandoned my principles. I felt bad, really bad for like a few days. But when another offer came in from a different user asking the same thing for the same price... I just couldn't say no. The bar wasn't even paying us any sort of unemployment anymore. We were like three months into lockdown and the money just sort of dried up. So by then, whether I liked it or not, I was almost entirely dependent on OnlyFans for my income. And when the requests got worse, I had little choice but to fulfill them. Looking back, I shouldn't have let it escalate. I could have kept things at the level they were at and still lived pretty comfortably until the New York City bar scene opened up again. But no. My greed took over and, at one point, I bought an entire pack of wet Italian sausage just so a guy could imagine what his junk would look like after I stamped on it in steel-toed work boots. I thought this was as bad as things would get. I was wrong. The red line event for me was getting a follower from another user827484 style account, the anonymous kind you always get the weirdest DMs or requests from. The guy threw an obscene dollar amount at me, but also mentioned that some of that money was for procuring materials, as he put it. Long story short, this person wanted me to head down to an apartment building where a Hispanic lady was selling puppies. I was to go down there, pick one up, then bring it back to my apartment. I asked why, but they wouldn't tell me. They just gave me some spiel about being genuine and being a huge source of potential income in the future. But this was a puppy. Nothing good could have come out of mixing only fans and baby animals. And what do you know? I was right. I won't go into too much detail about what this user wanted me to do, but it was some of the most evil, heinous stuff I'd ever heard. They wanted me to hurt the puppy, not just kill it, hurt it, over the course of days, maybe even weeks from some of the stuff that they were DMing me. When I outright denied their request, the threats began. Whenever I blocked an account, another one would pop up and pay the sub fee, knowing it would be returned when I inevitably blocked them. And by the time I started getting scared that this person or group of people I could never tell would get a hold of my contact details... I had to be brave enough to just click that little delete profile button and face the music. So, I'm currently living with my mom and her boyfriend out here in New Jersey. I can't actually describe how much it sucks to be living in a garage with my 
30th birthday fast approaching, but I also know my life could be so much worse. Every time I miss Williamsburg, every time I miss having my bank account being padded for next to no work at all, I just look over at Ripper, give him a pat and think, yeah, COVID has sucked. It's ruined a lot of lives, including mine. But at least, I have my pupper. I started an OnlyFans account a few years back now, and I've been recognized a grand total of three times because of my tattoos. I keep them covered up in my job because it's the kind that really doesn't like you showing off ink like that, let alone how badly they'd freak if they knew I had an OnlyFans. The point is, I like to be discreet, and my subs, for the most part, seem to understand that. The first time was about a week after my birthday. I told my subs that it was my birthday month to be discreet whilst still raking in the birthday tips. So although they didn't know exactly when I was born, they knew it was like roughly that time of the year. I had one guy give me a few looks on the subway, which isn't totally out of the ordinary if I'm honest, but just before he got off, he barely even looked at me as he said, happy birthday, and called me by my username. Like I said, he didn't make it obvious who he was talking to. He just ghosted immediately after and there was no other interaction. I mean, if you're going to get recognized for OnlyFans, you could do way, way worse than that. Second time was by a guy who literally screeched to stop on his bike, pedaled back to look at me, then turned bright red and said, oh my god and literally zoomed away like I was going to attack him or something. Granted, he could have been just having a moment, but trust me, when you have an OnlyFans, you just sort of know where people recognize you from. Anyway, now for the third time, and by far the worst time, I don't show my face on my OnlyFans, but I did used to show my tattoos, though not anymore. God bless those cute arm sleeve things. So, this one time, a guy stops, visibly starts checking out my tattoos, before he kind of gasps and looks up at me. I just play it cool, like there had been some kind of mistake. There blatantly hadn't, and just ignore him while I carry on reading and drinking my coffee. I half expected him to keep moving, but he didn't. He sat down next to me and started calling me by my username. I'd never been confronted like that, and it didn't exactly put me in the mood to be like, Oh, hi yeah, it's me. So I continued to deny it while also shooting him this look that tried to say, dude, stop, it's me, sure, but please just shut up. But then he reacts in such a horrid, violent way, like, what, you think I'm dumb, huh? You'll take my money, the money I work my butt off for, and you won't even acknowledge me in the street? That was his cue to just go off, and this guy just tore into me while an entire coffee shop and passersby looked on. I'd rather not give him the satisfaction of repeating what he said or go into detail about how much it hurt my feelings, but I'll put it this way. I spent almost $90 on arm sleeves to cover up my tats, and I haven't been recognized since. It really did mess with me for a while, though. Like the reoccurring thought was, you were lucky he found you in the day. If that had been the night on some dark street somewhere, I might not have been nearly as lucky and I might not have walked away at all. First of all, let me say this is not an indictment of OnlyFans. If someone wants to profit from sharing pictures of themselves or their body, that's totally their right, and I respect that. I'm not casting judgments on anyone who chooses to do so. But let me be clear. OnlyFans just about ruined my life, and I've never even set up a profile. It all kicked off not long after I broke up with a guy I'd been dating for about three to four months. As a single mom, it's way harder to get dates than I'd like it to be, but at the same time, I totally understand why someone wouldn't want to raise a child that isn't theirs. I mean, I wish more guys would be open to it, it's not like I'd never have a kid with them too, but... It's just a sad fact that it puts guys off when you've got a child from a prior relationship. So, you can imagine how excited I was when I met Richard. It's not his real name, but I'd rather not attract his attention, thank you very much. 
Having a six-year-old son didn't seem to bother him in the least bit, and he even asked a lot of questions about him. I found the whole thing so refreshing and mature that by the time Richard asked me out, I just about bit his arm off accepting the invite. But then the first red flag appeared when he started making comments about my son calling him Daddy. That wasn't the red flag in and of itself, it was more his reactions when I told him, no, my son has a dad and I don't want him confused as he grows up. Richard didn't seem to respect that position whatsoever and actually said some quite personal things regarding my taste in men, as well as the integrity of my son's father. It's a complicated situation, I'll concede that, but Richard's take on the whole thing was frankly disgusting and misogynistic. But given that it was a very unusual setup, I didn't want to give up on him so quickly, not since guys like him seem to be so hard to come by. But then, after two months of clashing, not often I should add, I had to face the music and accept that if there was a guy out there for me, it certainly wasn't him. I've dated guys for 18 months who took the breakup better than Richard. They're always rough, but I think if I actually told you what Richard did, you'd think that I was making this all up. Needless to say, his reaction totally justified my decisions to end things. End things, and that's exactly how I phrased it too. But that breakup was far from the end of my ordeal with Richard. And you know what? It's kind of my fault too. In fact, it's mostly my fault. Because if I hadn't been so trusting, I wouldn't even be writing this right now. The one big mistake I made was trusting Richard to keep private certain pictures I'd sent him. I think I trusted him because, well, he sent me pictures of him too. I think that's why there's a lot less nude leaks than there are nudes. It's like Americans and the Russians in the 80s, mutually assured destruction. You release mine, well, I'll release yours. But after we broke up, I deleted all of his intimate pictures, and I was foolish enough to think that he'd also done the same. Because the next thing I know, I got a message from a friend of mine saying something like, Oh, you have an OnlyFans. You go, girl. I had to ask her what OnlyFans was. I literally had no idea at the time. She replies like, you're joking, right? Was this supposed to be a secret? Immediately, I start googling OnlyFans, and as you can imagine, I'm pretty shocked at what I see. The whole website is basically homemade lewd images, and for those that aren't familiar, and from what I could gather, the girls in question make quite a lot of money, too. I mean, I wouldn't say no to an extra two grand a month, but I hadn't set up a profile, had I? I asked my friend to send me anything she's found with my name on it, then... What do you know? There's a freaking OnlyFans profile set up in my name, and the whole preview picture in the banner was a raunchy picture that I'd sent to Richard. The profile said, like, free to subscribe, so I made a dummy user account to sign up, only to discover that Richard must have uploaded about 10 different pictures I'd sent to him, all with these disgusting captions that I'd rather not repeat here. I was angry, so angry but I didn't get scared until I saw that he'd put up my home address. My actual home address, apartment number, postcode, everything. It kicked in how much danger I was in, and I just burst into tears thinking that my own selfish actions had exposed my only son to danger. I know it was all Richard, and I know if he was just normal, then yeah, it wouldn't have happened. But I'm a mother, I should know better. I'm not some attention-seeking teenager anymore. I just wanted to feel wanted, though. Surely people can understand that. In the end, I managed to get the profile taken down, and I think OnlyFans and other sites like that now make you verify your identity so stuff like that can't happen again. But what if you manage to get a hold of a girl's ID or something? The system they have doesn't completely eliminate the chance of fake profiles being set up. Like I said at the start, I don't mean to judge anyone who wants to do that kind of thing. I just hope they have their safety and security in mind because, as I think we all know, there are some serious psychos out there. In late 2016, the father of British entrepreneur Tim Stokely gave him a loan of £10,000. It wasn't the first time Tim had received a business loan, 
and as much as he assured his father that he'd return every penny of it, Guy Stokely was skeptical. Out of the handful of loans he'd already given his son, Tim had failed to pay any of them back in full. This is going to be the last one, Guy reportedly told him. It was Tim's last, best chance, and he was determined not to screw it up. So in November of 2016, Tim founded a website, one designed for use by artists, performers, and content creators of all varieties to provide video clips and photographs to monthly subscribers. Tim's brother Thomas became the company's operating officer, while Guy occupied the rather fitting position of chief finance officer. All that was left to do was come up with a name for the company, and together, they decided to call it OnlyFans. Initially, OnlyFans catered to a small but fairly lucrative clientele. It didn't exactly make Tim Stokely an overnight millionaire, but it was definitely more successful than any of his previous ventures. However, many of his fellow entrepreneurs noticed the untapped potential of such a business, noting low overhead costs and boundless availability, and it wasn't long before one of them made their move. Two years after the company's founding, Ukrainian-American business magnate Leonid Redvinsky contacted the Stokely family with an offer they couldn't refuse. For an undisclosed sum, Redvinsky acquired a 75% stake in OnlyFans' parent company, effectively gaining complete control of the business. Although the exact amount isn't readily available online, the fact that Tim Lau lives in a gated mansion with a cinema and sauna in Bishop Stortford, Hertfordshire, we can safely assume it was an obscene amount of money. But Radvinsky didn't just recognize the company's potential. He had a vision for it. You see, previous to purchasing OnlyFans, Radvinsky had owned and operated the adult-oriented webcam site my free cams, and given that he understood how lucrative such an industry was, he knew that if he pushed OnlyFans into the explicit direction he had in mind, he had a potential billion dollar business idea on his hands. By mid-2019, OnlyFans had become one of the primary sources of amateur adult themed content on the internet. Charging just a 20% fee for all transactions, OnlyFans seemingly took all the selling power out of the hands of the adult industry and put it right into the hands of its users. And as a result, one news outlet noted that OnlyFans has gained a pop culture reputation for being a hive of adult-themed content. Yet it wasn't until April 2020 that the website truly exploded, when Beyonce Knowles released a remix of the Megan Thee Stallion song Savage. The remix included the lyric, Hips TikTok when I dance, on that demon time, she might start an OnlyFans. Listeners rushed to find out what Beyonce was referencing, and what followed was a boom in popularity that no social media site had ever experienced before. CEO Tim Stokely claimed OnlyFans was seeing about 200,000 new users every 24 hours, and 7,000 to 8,000 new creators joining every day. By August, American actress Bella Thorne reportedly earned $1 million in 24 hours after opening a profile on the site a watershed moment in what had become a burgeoning industry of guerrilla adult content. As of today, OnlyFans has over 2 million content creators and more than 130 million users, and one of those users is named Kathleen West. 42-year-old Kathleen Cat West met her husband Jeff West at a 2004 Super Bowl party. Jeff was working as a recruiter for the U.S. Army at the time, and after chatting and swapping contact information at the party, the pair began dating. It seems they must have fallen in love pretty quickly because it only took four months for Jeff to propose marriage. Kat accepted, and the couple tied the knot after traveling from their humble Alabama home to the bright lights of Las Vegas. Their relationship continued to move at a rapid pace, with their first child arriving in 2005. And although Jeff's job took him all over the Deep South, their nomadic lifestyle didn't seem to dampen their romance, and for a long, long time, Kat and Jeff were still very much in love. In 2014, the Wests moved to a small Alabama city of about 15,000 known as Calera. Jeff had retired from the army by this point, but soon found work as a campus police officer at the nearby Birmingham Southern College. The only trouble was, 
The job didn't bring in nearly as much income as his recruiter's position did, leaving the young family's finances with a sizable hole in it. But around 18 months after the move, Cat had an idea to bring in a second income for the family after hearing of a little website known as OnlyFans. She started up a profile under the username Kitty Cat West, and over the weeks and months that followed, found herself garnering a few hundred subscribers from the risque photos she posted. But without doubt, the most lucrative part of her new modeling gig was the special requests she'd received from followers. If Cat dressed, posed, or behaved in a specific way, certain subscribers would tip her double, sometimes even triple their subscription amount. It seems at first Jeff was more than happy to help her bring in that second income, and even took some of the more revealing photos himself, which makes what happened next and the ultimate explanation for it make very little sense at all. Cut on the night of January 12, 2018, Jeff and Kat were out on a date, something they did regularly as a way of keeping their marriage fresh and healthy, while the couple's 12-year-old daughter, Logan, was spending the night at Jeff's parents' place. Like most of their date nights, the couple attended a fancy dinner at an upmarket restaurant, drinking multiple bottles of wine in the process. At around 8.45pm, Kat and Jeff stopped by a liquor store and were filmed by the establishment's security cameras purchasing additional bottles of alcohol. When they arrived back home, they were carried on drinking for a while with Kat changing into some lingerie before asking Jeff to take her picture. What happened between then and the following morning had been hotly disputed by both professional and amateur sleuths alike, but the fact remains that as the sun rose on the 13th of January, a neighbor discovered Kat's lifeless body lying on the sidewalk opposite the West's abode. Lying next to her was a half-empty bottle of liquor as well as her cell phone. The cause of death was later determined to be an acute skull fracture caused by a single heavy blow from a blunt object. There was no sign of any lewd interference with her body, although a closer examination revealed that she had recently made love. Her blood alcohol content was 0.23, which is just shy of three times the legal drunk driving limit, so there's no doubt that she was highly intoxicated at the time of her death. As you can imagine, one of the first people the police suspected of being the murderer was Kat's husband, Jeff. He was taken for an interview in the local police precinct that supposedly lasted over five hours, and after his release, those that interview him announced that he was cooperating with their investigation. But the police also investigated a number of suspects they believe Kat had come in contact with via her OnlyFans site, or the several social media pages connected with it. Given the nature of her content, police began to theorize that an obsessive or disgruntled fan might be to blame, and that Kat's work had earned her a stalker that would eventually work up to taking her life. Investigators found very little evidence of any interactions with the homicidal stalker, but an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and there's little doubt that Kat had several extremely devoted fans whose interest in her verged into the unhealthy. Regardless, the police decided that Jeff was their best bet, and shortly after, he was arrested on suspicion of murder. During his arraignment, the prosecution offered Jeff what's commonly known as an Alfred plea. This is when a defendant maintains their innocence, but also while admitting that the prosecutor has enough evidence to convict him of the crime in question. Had Jeff accepted, he would have done time served than just a two-year probationary sentence, essentially absolving him of his wife's murder in what the prosecution assumed was a classic crime of passion. This is just about the sweetest deal that any spousal murderer could possibly find in front of them. Yet the idea of allowing the legal system to brand him a man that murdered his wife, that was simply unacceptable to Jeff, and he decided to take the case to trial in order to completely clear his name. This means that either Jeff was arrogant to the point of delusion, or... Jeff really was innocent of Kat's murder. Before his murder trial was due to begin, Jeff was offered yet another plea deal by the prosecution. But again, this was flatly rejected by a man who was steadfast in his declarations of innocence. Jeff was being advised by his defense attorney that the prosecution's case was flimsy and that they barely had enough for a conviction. 
but the prosecution had a trick up their sleeve. They asked the judge if an additional last-minute charge could be added to Jeff's rap sheet, one known as reckless manslaughter, that carried a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. They knew that if all the details of the case came out, that it would be almost impossible to convince the jury that what happened that night was outright murder. But paint the killing as a crime of passion and charge him with a lesser crime, and the jury might concur enough for them to land a guilty verdict. It worked, and Jeff was convicted and sentenced to 16 years in prison. But the question remains, was Jeff West actually responsible for the death of his wife? Well, not only did Jeff have ample opportunity to commit the crime, but it's difficult to argue against the idea that Kat was doing things both online or offline that could have made Jeff angry, possessive, or overtly jealous. On top of that, the bottle of liquor found near Kat's corpse had Jeff's fingerprints on it. That might well be expected, given it was the same one they had purchased just a few hours previously. But as the prosecution pointed out, Jeff's fingerprints appeared in an inverted pattern, indicating that he had held the bottle upside down at some point, possibly during the act of hitting Cat over the head with it. The prosecution also pointed out that the bottle had a sliver of glass missing from it, but this could have just easily been incurred if Cat had tripped and fallen at any point. However, the positioning of the bottle, leaning perfectly at Cat's cell phone, was deeply suspicious and the prosecution argued that it had been deliberately placed there by Jeff after he'd struck her with it. There was also Jeff's apparent lack of emotion, as one witness put it, upon discovering that his wife's corpse had been found. He didn't ask for any updates or details on her condition, and this is very inconsistent with commonly agreed upon innocent behavior. There were also several inconsistencies in Jeff's version of events. Firstly, he told the police that he went to bed alone at around 10.30 that evening. However, a health-related application on his cell phone showed that he was up and moving around just past 11 p.m. Jeff also says that the next time he awoke was the following morning when his dogs began to bark at the attending police officers in the street outside. Yet a neighbor testified that she saw Jeff pacing back and forth much earlier than the cops showed up, almost as if though he was worried about something. Here's what the police claimed had happened. They claimed text messages showed that an argument was unfolding on the same night of the murder. Jeff was unhappy with Kat's ever-increasing drinking habits, as well as her increased interactions with her OnlyFans followers. Kat's phone was cracked when her body was found, and while Jeff claims this is from where she fell, homicide detectives assert that it occurred when he tossed her phone out into the street in an act of rage. As she went to retrieve the phone, she took the bottle of alcohol with her and in a drunken rage, Jeff followed her out into the street, grabbed the bottle from her, and hit her over the head with it. While Jeff insisted that Kat had simply fallen, police argued that such an impact would have knocked her out cold. But if that was the case, why were there two pools of blood at the crime scene? Sure, it was feasible that Kat fell, hit her head, stood up, then fell over again, but the prosecution argued this was highly unlikely. Not only that, but the damage done to her skull would have been impossible to achieve through an accidental fall alone, especially when Kat's height was factored into the equation. Therefore, it stands to reason that Jeff had hit her over the head with the bottle, and that this was the blunt force trauma that ended her life. It's a sad reality that many spouses or partners of OnlyFans users have reacted badly to their online presence and we can understand why irrational possessiveness or jealousy might cause Jeff to act in a violent or controlling manner. But Jeff had absolutely no history of violence. By all accounts, he was an exemplary soldier with a pristine disciplinary record. Police also failed to find any blood on Jeff's clothes, or any other incriminating tissue for that matter, which amounts to a solid example of what we'd call reasonable doubt. Kat also had a history of falling over whilst intoxicated, an inevitable result of her love for hard liquor and six-inch heels, and while it's not certain that a fall killed her, it's not an overly outrageous explanation. It's also very possible that Kat may have picked up one or two obsessive fans as a result of her online presence. She was posting pictures on OnlyFans for years and engaged with scores of users to fulfill personal requests or one-to-one -one interactions. 
It seems much more likely that one of these users could be overwhelmed with jealousy, given Kat's marital status, especially since Jeff was apparently just fine with Kat's online activity, so much so that he participated in the creation of it. Is it possible that some maniacal online stalker managed to catch Kat standing drunk in the street, then managed to kill her in a way that a completely innocent man could be implicated? The horrifying thing about this case is that's very, very possible. So no matter how you look at it, and as unjust and tragic as it may be, having an OnlyFans account may well have been a direct contributor to a woman's brutal and untimely murder. Based in Richmond, Texas, 33-year-old Instagram influencer and freelance model, Janae Gagne, had the kind of lifestyle that many can only dream of having. Having amassed over 2 million followers on her various social media profiles, Gagne reportedly netted a six-figure income as a result of her many sponsorship and endorsement deals. Using the pseudonym Mercedes Moore, Gagne's social media followers included the likes of Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Snoop Dogg, and Meek Mill, meaning that by August of 2020, she was arguably one of the most famous social media influencers on the planet. Like many of her peers, being introduced to the website OnlyFans presented Gagne with a lucrative opportunity. Interact even more intimately with her gargantuan online following, whilst also opening up a potentially massive new revenue stream. But according to Janae's father, Mark, the titanic amount of attention she received brought just as many problems as it did benefits. We kept her real private. Not even some of her friends knew her real name. They just called her Mercedes. I moved my daughter into new apartments three times because of my insecurities, he said late last year. The sheer number of people following her online it scared me, he continued. Some of them followed her because they admired her, loved her even, but some were crazy and obsessed. It was just obviously unhealthy. So at around 4pm on Sunday, August 29th of 2020, when Mark Gagne hadn't heard from his daughter for almost 48 hours, he decided to stop by her home in Cortland Apartments to check on her. He pulled up, knocked on the door, but no one answered. Mark Gagne then pulled out his cell phone and gave his daughter a call, swearing he could almost hear it vibrating from somewhere inside. That's when he heard movement coming from inside the house. He hadn't heard from his daughter in days, and no one was answering the door to her apartment, so who was moving around inside? Mark Gagne said that he began to suspect something was horribly, horribly wrong, so in the next instant, he reeled back and sent his foot flying into the lock, kicking it open in one furious attempt. The sight that greeted him inside instantly broke his heart. There was his beloved daughter, lying lifeless at the bottom of the stairs. Her apartment had been completely trashed, and there appeared to be lipstick graffiti all over the walls of the apartment. Yet before he had a chance to read any of it, Mark Gagne heard a noise coming from upstairs. Mark says that in the heat of the moment, he thought his daughter might have fallen down the stairs and broken her neck. But hearing something coming from upstairs had him bolting up to that floor as fast as his legs could carry him. Only then did he see a man lying in a pool of his own blood, gurgling and choking with a knife stuck in his throat as the life slipped away from him. Mark demanded answers from the dying man, but it was too late. He passed away just moments after Janae's father had broken into her home. Yet in a disturbing twist of fate, Mark Gagne wouldn't be plagued by questions for very long, because after he called 911, he began to read some of the lipstick graffiti that had been scrawled on the walls. I was used for money, read one piece. I should have stayed in Florida, read another. The final piece Mark read was, I wish I never loved her. Sorry to the landlord and the family. He couldn't bring himself to read any more. Although it appeared that his daughter's murderer had been scrawling over the walls for days, he'd summed up his feeling and motive in just a few short sentences, and to Mark, it only confirmed that his worst nightmares had come to life. Janae's killer turned out to be a 34-year-old Florida man by the name of Kevin Acorto. 
a man with such unhealthy obsession with Janae that he somehow managed to track her down and kill her, all before taking his own life. He did not have any kind of prior arrest record in his home state, but during the subsequent investigation, police tried to establish that he'd had any prior history of mental health issues. I don't even know how he found her, Mark Gagne later said. I guarded my daughter. I wouldn't even let her friends know where she lived. Police still don't know how or when he got to Texas. There's so much that's still a mystery. The news of her death was broke by a Canadian rapper, Tory Lanes, who paid tribute to her with a post that read, Rest in Peace Queen. But few of the tributes seemed to address the causes of her death. She was very cautious about her surroundings, Janae's mother, Janetta Grover, said. But unfortunately, someone basically was stalking and killed my baby. It's irrefutably horrific and abhorrent that Kevin Acorto was able to track down and kill such an innocent young woman, but it's clear that Mark Gagne's fears were justified. No matter how much he tried to keep his daughter safe, the determination her stalkers showed in locating her significantly outweighed their efforts, and somehow, a man who wasn't exceptionally computer literate was about to somehow track down her home address. Some have speculated that Corto somehow got hold of Janae's billing information and discovered her real name and address in that way. In which case, OnlyFans has a long way to go before it can truly secure its content creator's privacy and security. So maybe, until then, the risks of having an alluring online presence will outweigh any potential financial reward. In September of 2020, a 20-year-old Australian university student posted a harrowing personal account to the popular social media site, Reddit. In it, she detailed the terrifying ordeal she'd been subjected to after posting intimate pictures of herself on a social media page known as OnlyFans, one involving obsessive stalking, internet loopholes, and ultimately, a clear and present threat to her life. Only through a completely anonymous throwaway account did she feel safe enough to share her story, adding that her local police force had finally taken action against the person responsible. But even then, the girl made it clear that her complaints should have been taken seriously long before she was in any imminent danger. According to the girl, the incidents all started after she moved back with her parents during the summer break. The girl was particularly excited to be home as the family had just bought a new puppy, by all accounts, the girl was having a ball getting to know her new furry friend, but as anyone who's ever had a puppy will tell you, to say they can be erratic would be the understatement of the century. One night, the girl awoke to hear her puppy yelping at the back door. They were in the middle of potty training, but the pup didn't quite have the hang of it yet, so she climbed out of bed, put on her slippers, and went downstairs to let the dog out. She says it was as late as 2 a.m., and there didn't seem to be another soul around as she stepped down into the night, but she soon found that she wasn't entirely alone. I saw this figure in a car, she said. I could tell they were looking at me, but it was pitch black outside, and I couldn't make out their face. I felt a bit uneasy, but I didn't really think anything of it. Only when I go back inside, the car started up and followed me up my driveway. The terror of such an experience is undeniable. And even though the girl was so close to home, there's no denying that being out alone in the middle of the night made her very vulnerable indeed. I was terrified, the girl added. I sprinted back inside and locked the door, and kept an eye out for them in case they tried to break in. But as far as I know, they just backed out of our driveway and left. When she woke up the following morning, after a terrible night of restless sleep and deep concern, the girl found an envelope inside her parents' letterbox. The envelope contained not only 20 Australian dollars in cash, but also her OnlyFans username. I thought long and hard about how he could have found my parents' address, the girl said, and I worked out that the problems didn't start until I shared my Amazon wish list. OnlyFans and Amazon were both adamant that their security systems prevent leaks like that from taking place. However, it appeared that wasn't the issue as third-party sellers are not bound to the same data protection laws as large multinational companies. 
Although she doesn't know for certain how her stalker got her address, the girl is 90% sure that they got in touch with a third-party seller and obtained her home address in that way. Whether it was money, coercion, or intimidation that caused the seller to give up the info is another question entirely, but the fact remains that it's the most likely of all explanations. After that, when I moved back to the college town where I was studying, I stopped posting content, the girl goes on to explain. But somehow my stalker still managed to track me down. The girl said she basically closed down her OnlyFans account and started a YouTube account because of how unsafe the former felt. Her first big vlogging project was due to be a shopping trip to a local mall, but when she got to her car to depart for the day, she found it had been ransacked. The vlogging camera was missing too, she said. I know, it's my fault for leaving it in the car, but I was using it the night before and since I lived in a gated area, I didn't think I would be unsafe. Yet she added that the camera was inside of her glove box and contained an SD card with unreleased photos and videos on it. It was almost like someone knew it was there, but as bad as that was, it only got weirder from there. She eventually contacted her building security personnel, asking if they could review security camera footage from the previous few nights. And it was through this that not only did she see a man break into her car and ignore other cars in the parking lot, but she also had proof she was being deliberately singled out for targeted harassment. After they got the camera, they walked around the duplex until stopping near my window, the girl wrote. My bedroom faces an outside street and the blinds are broken so it's very easy to see in. I have a curtain, but it doesn't cover my window all the way. Look, what I'm trying to say is, this person watched me sleep for an hour or so. I have no idea why they didn't try to break in, but thank God they didn't. The woman explained her camera was later recovered at a nearby secondhand store, suggesting whoever is stalking her has a prior history of criminality. However, she added that the camera's memory card was missing. I know he kept it as some kind of trophy, I just know it, she added, and has since moved and hopes her stalker hasn't followed. I believe the police are still trying to track them down, but I have broken my lease and moved to a new place, so hopefully this will keep me safe. But what's so scary about the girl's story is that it seems like only a matter of time before the stalker decides to take things further. Unless they're caught, stalkers will only ever escalate their activities until their obsession reaches a deadly and permanent end. So this might not be directly related to OnlyFans membership, but it definitely scared me. So here goes. I'm a 45 year old overweight guy from Philly. Never in a million years would anyone want to see me naked. Maybe they'd pay me to keep my clothes on, but definitely not the other way around. I also work with a revolving door of different offices from all over the East Coast, meaning that there's not really a set team I work with and sometimes I can be working with total strangers from day to day. So at one point, we're in a group email talking about how we've been handling our projects over the weekend. I said that I've been a little busy responding to my OnlyFans followers and that I'd only found the time to get a little of it finished. Just a throwaway comment, obviously sarcastic, especially if you know me. But then one of the CCs chimes in like, what in God's name is OnlyFans? Someone explains to her what it is and why it's funny and that I might be popular on it. But our coworker just doesn't seem to get the joke and at one point she asked me, do you really make homemade smut like that? The way she asked me caught me off guard and yes, I'd be lying if I said a little bit of laughter didn't creep out in that moment just from the shock of her asking. I tell her, no, that really was just a joke and I think that's the end of the issue. But the following week, my boss gets in touch to ask if I can take part in a Zoom call with some members of upper management. I think this is promotion related so of course I accept. But as it turned out, they basically tricked me into a disciplinary call that involved them asking a whole bunch of probing questions about, you guessed it, my non-existent OnlyFans account. I tried to explain that it was just a joke but they didn't seem interested at all. 
only that it was damaging to the company that I might have an account. Once I assured them that I didn't, they basically called me a liar, and they claimed that the only reason that they dragged me up was because the cops had been in touch. Turns out our humorless little friend had tried to make me out to be some sick freak, even predatorizing children, and had just told the cops to search his name on fans only, to find out what a sick freak I was. I was never all that worried about getting fired since I didn't have an account, but rumors that I was a kitty diddler going around town could have been really bad for my health. Definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me, let alone involving work or the internet. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.